Mary Mackay is the head baker and co-owner of Terra Breads, a bakery cafe specializing in crusty breads and baked goods. In addition to their four bakery cafes they own throughout Greater Vancouver, they also sell their bread and rolls to a growing number of restaurants and hotels in the area. Please join me in welcoming Mary Mackay. I'm a bit out of my element because um, usually, well, I'm not usually in front of a crowd talking about myself. I don't, I'm not quite comfortable with that, and we'll see how that goes over the next few minutes. But I do spend time at the bakery talking to people about what we do and what I'm passionate about. It's bread. Um, the difference here is that I don't have my mixers and my sourdough starters and all the great ovens to show you and wow you with all that. But uh, So I brought a few little props that I hope I can wow you with. Um, I want to tell you just uh, three things tonight. I wanted to tell you a little bit about me and my passion and how I ended up where I am today and what's so special and what I feel is so special about Terra Breads and also my own personal food journey where I where I want to go now and where I've um, things that I've started to do through networking in this wonderful food industry in Vancouver that has opened new doors for me as well. Uh, thank you Richard for asking me to come tonight. I think it was uh, I was a little bit nervous again, as I'll mention that a few times. Um, I think that I ended up here tonight because I was emailing Richard to ask a favor for, I needed some publicity for a fundraiser I was doing. And he said, oh, it just so happens I have something for you to do, so. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> Anyways, I, um, I've always loved food, so, and you'll probably hear this from any chef or any, anybody in the food industry, that I think it's, it's something that's in you, you grow up, there's a passion um, that was ignited very young. I had a grandmother that baked every day, so I was exposed to cooking at home. We sat down at a table every night, ate at, um, great food. And uh, as I started to get into my teens, my parents said it was time to go out and get a job. I guess I was being a little bit too restless. I was a Vancouver girl, 1980s, into punk rock. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, anyways, parents felt that I needed to sort of put my energy into other areas. So I was sent out to get a job. The first start was um, my older sister had a job at the Dutch Pentacle House, which is still here. And uh, she was a, had a uh, job as a waitress. So I was sent off, and I think I managed to get through maybe a month or two in my waitressing job. But again, remember the the punk rock, the blue hair, and um, you know, 16 years old and I'm getting up at 7 in the morning to go off and serve coffee to people that are very grumpy until they get their coffee and I just wasn't prepared to take lip from people so there was one day where I may have let the F-bomb slip to a customer in the morning but I just wasn't prepared to serve and uh, I was blessed because the owner, rather than sending me out the door, um, said, you know what, we're going to switch you. And um, one of the girls in the kitchen, she really wants to be on the floor. She prefers to get the, the, weight, um, the tips, which I'm sure she would do way better than I would. <laughs> and, uh, and so you can trade and you can go into the kitchen. So that was the beginning. So that was 16 years old. And uh, I, I learned to make those big giant pancakes at the Dutch Pancake House. I carried on from there. So that was um, early high school. I went on and worked at Umberto's and a few other places and then decided that after a little time um, cooking I decided that it was either UBC which mom and dad had set aside for and we had talked about in depth it was accounting I don't <laughs> um, but I decided uh, it was not going to be it was going to be cooking school and my mom had hired a caterer to come over one time and uh, this lovely uh, girl came from um, Pierre de Brules, had this beautiful binder, French cooking school, and she talked about, you know, we go and we just go to class all day and we just cook and we talk about food and we learn about the history of food, and so that was it. So, um, I, and I have this moment that I clearly remember with my mother, bless my mother, she's <laughs> in the kitchen ironing away, and uh, I said, Mom, you know, the, the money that, that you said you had set aside, could I use that tuition to go to a, a French cooking school? And you know, she sort of, uh, what do you mean? And I said, well, instead of UBC, I really want to go to French cooking school. So uh, my mother, <laughs> she's just ironing away, looks down, she said, 
why on earth would you want to spend your life cooking? I have been cooking my life. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I persevered. I think that was the, the blue, the punk rock in me sort of. Persevered through that, um, and I went through and, and my mom is, she is proud, my dad are proud now. And um, so from, from cooking, I did what a, a young chef does. You, you hop around to different restaurants and you get exposed to different cuisines and styles and, and you start to have great experiences. So that sort of moved me along. I had some really great experiences. It was a, a really wacky restaurant back in the 80s called The Frog and Peach that I worked at. That was a classic. Um, I'll just give you, I'm not going to go too, too far. I, I told Richard I was worried I wouldn't be able to fill up 10 minutes, but I do, once I get going, I may talk too much. <laughs> um, I just want to tell you one little story about the frog and peach. One of my favorite moments was we had a food writer coming in, Jürgen, um, Jürgen Goff, and he was with, uh, this slipped my mind for the moment, but it'll come back. He's up at uh, table number three, and, and from the kitchen I can see the table. And our restaurant, um, the owner had, the family lived upstairs, so the teenagers would come down, run through their kitchen, their bare feet in the day. He had a beautiful um, do dog that looked like a wolf that was always running through and stealing lamb chops. <laughs> and, um, and at some point, kittens arrived. And <laughs> kittens um, made their way, and I, the first thing I'd do, get into work and get the kittens out from under the counter so I could start my mise en place. And um, so during one of these dinners, the, the server came up and she said, oh, you know, um, I want to let you know there's a food writer up on, on table three. So I look up and look across. It's kind of at the end of the room. And the kittens are underneath the, it was, oh, sorry, it, I've got my name, Jack Webster. <laughs> so it's Jurgen Goth and it's Jack Webster. And there's kittens under the table <laughs> in the restaurant. So I had to send... Uh, the waitress with a little uh, piece of raw salmon to try and coax the kittens out so that they wouldn't find... Anyways, they never found them. I digress. <laughs> so I moved along restaurant to restaurant, had great experiences, hop around Vancouver, and then I uh, took a trip out to Montreal and started um, moving in, getting involved, doing pastries, and from there I'm just going to speed track back to Vancouver again. and. Um, started uh, from my work doing pastries I started doing some breads in a few restaurants in Vancouver nothing that exciting I was trying to do my own sourdough cultures I would uh, put them on the window in the bakery and they would turn blue and I would throw them out I had no idea what I was doing um, and then I had a friend call up and say you know there's this big time movie producer who's come up from LA and uh, he's looking, he's going to open this really awesome bakery and you have to come down and meet him. And this just tells you how stories just get totally blown out of proportion. So still a little bit of punk rock in me. So I don't have the blue home mohawk, but I've got the um, motorcycle prod rocket and my black leather jacket and I think I had a silly ponytail and several earrings. And I jump on my bike and I go down to meet Mike Lansky, who's the supposed big time movie producer. And, um, but he's not, he's, he's just, he's a Canadian who ended up working in the States who wanted to come back to Canada, um, not a big time movie producer, and he had fallen in love with bread, he was living in LA, and lived near a bakery called La Brea, and they make beautiful, beautiful sourdough breads, and Michael's work was just a few blocks away, and I call it, I don't know if he would call this, I think it was a midlife crisis that he quit his job and wanted to open a bakery, but we managed to meet just for a few minutes and talk about bread, and um, that was it. I was hooked. I just I thought this was going to be an amazing adventure. So we started out 1993, uh, small bakery Kitsilano, and uh, seven employees all together, and um, it, we just did um, a few. I think maybe seven sourdough breads. Now. Again, I had been working on my sourdoughs and, you know, I had my pastry training, my cooking background, but no, ba master baker I was not. So Michael had hired a baker to come from France. His name was Lionel. And he started studying um, the art of bread making when he was 14 years old. And he came over and, and he was going to come and help teach me how to use the equipment and make the handle sourdough starters and do the bread. The deal was that 
Leonel was going to spend one month and uh, stay at the bakery and train me. But it was to my good fortune that he ended up getting stuck in Vancouver. He couldn't get his green card. So I got eight months, day in, day out, working with this wonderful baker. So I, I feel really blessed because he really uh, taught me a lot about what I find so fascinating, which I haven't, you know, over 19 years now, I'm still in love and passion, fascinated with sourdough and fermentation. It's, you know, it's very similar to wine making, beer making, um, and it's ever-changing. I remember one, one thought I had going into the bakery was, how am I going to um, not get bored? How am I going to go from a restaurant where I walk in every day as a pastry chef and I can open the fridge and I can make whatever I want, you know, and create the special of the day and the menu would change. How am I going to make that same Levain loaf day in, day out and sell it? And what I didn't realize that time is that I've never made the same Levain loaf and I never will because it's so organic, it's so alive that the process changes constantly and I'm always trying to achieve a better loaf. So that's kept me really really fascinated. So I wanted to share a little bit of that enthusiasm I have. I brought my props. So we're going to talk sourdough. So I want you to taste I brought a culture and I want to tell you a little bit about what I feel makes um, Fairbread special. So this, these are just little um, sticks that are all clean and then after I'm going to be passing out a used. So just for you to dip in if, if you'd like to try the, the sourdough culture. So at, in the bakery we do a process when we make the sourdough, it's three days from start to finish for the bread to develop. And again, it's really not as exciting here as it is in the bakery when you get to see and smell it. Because that's, that's the best thing. When I can walk you into a proofing room and it smells like the yeast, it's like, what well, it smells? It's like a wine winery. It's just, it's heaven, the proofers. So we have a culture and um, there's all different names you can use for sourdough cultures. This is, we personalize it, we call it mother. I don't know why it, it just started that way. So it started 19 years ago, um, just in our home kitchens. I, I think I had a rye and a, a whole wheat and Michael had one in his kitchen. And it's nothing but flour and water. So people are saying, oh, you know, is there some secret to what you do? Do you put potatoes or do you put grapes? Or what do you use to start? It's just flour and water. So all you need is um, organic flour and good filtered water and, and um, a lot of love to keep it going because you do have to babysit it and feed it all the time. And so we personalized it so that it, it is a living culture. So this is um, what we call mother. And this is um, something that we take every day to make, pull out a little bit to make a, a stage of dough. And then we replenish, so it's alive. So this is fed. Oh, this is good. This is fed um, about 11 o'clock this morning. And by a feed, I mean that we give it more flour and water. And uh, then it's allowed to ferment over time, so it develops. So it does all the action that it's supposed to. Where um, inside the culture, the starches will turn into sugars. Carbon dioxide is the bubbles that give off. Basically, we're just creating flavors with a balance of. Um, acids which come and enzymes which give us flavor. So that, if you, you're welcome if you want to try it and just pass it along. That's organic whole wheat. And then from, <coughs> from that um, stage, from the, the liquid mother, we take that and we stiffen it up a little bit and start to make a dough. So this goes through another 24 hours. So we start with the first feed and we create this starter and it ferments for 24 hours. And what this does is it, again, it's just giving a, a long, slow rise. So it's allowing 
um, properties in the, the flower to change. And so different flavors will come through and there's enzymatic changes. So it also will change, people will talk a lot about gluten. Gluten is two proteins. Gluten comes together because of two proteins that exist in the wheat. And so when they come into contact with water, um, they start to develop and they bond. Over time, you will um, change your gluten properties through fermentation. So even though we have a gluten form here, um, this gluten will actually be more easily digest digestible over time through fermentation. So sometimes people that have difficulty eating regular uh, flours will find that a sourdough is a little easier on the system. So this one, um, I'm not going to get all messy, I'll just show you this part's the fun part. Is that you can just start to see the stuff that gets me really excited. Is inside, oh. you'll see the structure, and that's what the gluten starts to do, it makes this beautiful web. And that's just a sign, everything that we want in our sourdough bread is this nice, open, porous consistency. And that is all the structure of the bread coming. So this one, you don't have to taste, but it's just it's lovely to smell. Should we smell it? You just smell it. smell it. You like it? Does it smell like wine, or? <laughs> you, can look you can taste it. Yeah, you're welcome. So that's once that has gone through its its fermentation to develop flavor. Then the next day, I'm going to pass you one just for your use. Compost all that. Um, then it's going to go in and. The next stage then is it's going to go into a piece of that starter is going to go in. We're going to add more flour, water, sea salt, and then we shape it. And then it again, the whole process, very long and slow, will go through another long fermentation time. So, and that, that part's more interesting in the bakery because then you can really walk through and see how it, it moves around from different rooms, time and temperature is controlled. Um, so that we're all manipulating to get a certain flavor and a certain profile out of the breads. Uh, then we add um, different ingredients depending on what we're looking for. Each bread is unique. So it's not a matter of making one big batch of sourdough and pulling off and at, folding some cheese in here, raisins in here. Each um, bread that we do is unique. So there's different flours used different um, consistencies. Some are designed to be like a pecan fruit, which I think is the ultimate bread that um, should be married with cheese. It's, it's more of a fruit cake than it is a bread. Uh, so we can have a lot of fun creating the, the breads that we do. And um, from the breads we've spun off over the years. So I mentioned earlier that we started with our seven employees. We had one location in Kits, and about a year and a half into the process, we had the opportunity for Granville Island. So we got a call, and Granville Island had a space open. Originally, Michael wanted Granville Island, but there wasn't a spot that was right for us, and we were so tired at that point. Oh, am I already done? I didn't tell you. If, oh my gosh, we got halfway. All right. Is there anything else I didn't tell you? I want to show you a, a loaf of bread just before I wrap it up. <laughs> Holy so cow! Its location where it is now? It's still in the same place. Is that the same place my boss. Yes. So just my last prop is I just want to show you my favorite bread. <laughs> sourdough. <laughs> so sourdough with um, this has a mixture of spelt flour and rye flour, whole wheat flour a country sourdough bread. So I can, I'm gonna rip it open and just pass it around. Again, you can smell it or if you'd like to pull off a piece, please do. My last prop that I'm going to show you is just that we've partnered with a group called um, Lawns to Loaves in Vancouver. So there's an organization, the Environmental Youth Organization is planting wheat throughout Vancouver, all different heritage varieties. 
So we've been growing wheat on the patio at the bakery. And um, they're a, f a fabulous, if you look up Lawn Stilogues, they're doing a great job. They pulled off uh, 70 pounds that we um, grew, gathered throughout the city, uh, peddled, um, bicycled, ground it into flour, and then uh, made pizza and baked it off and ate it at a party. So that's a fun one. Can I come back again and tell you more? <laughs>